In the Battle of Britain, we took such a hammering from the mighty German Air Force. I knew then something would have to be done to stop the onslaught of the Nazi Empire. But never did I imagine that I would be asked to lead the campaign, to launch the largest invasion in European history. It reminds me now of another English general by the name of Henry, who faced a similar task some 500 years ago. For a muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention. See this online space created thus as a kingdom for our stage. Princes to act, monarchs to behold the swelling scene. Then should the warlike Henry, like himself, assume the port of Mars, and at his heels, leased in like hounds, should gold, sword, Juno, crouch for employment. But pardon, soldiers all, the flat upraised spirits that have dared on this unworthy scaffold to bring forth so great an object. Can this cockpit hold the vasty fields of France, the beaches of Normandy, the snow-covered forests of the Ardennes, the battered shell-shocked town of Baston? Or may we cram within your screens the very casks 
that did a fright the air at Agincourt. <laughs> I ask on your imaginary forces work in this small place we are so confined to. If you are a button or rivet counter, look not for accuracy here in our portrayal of historical events, but imagine, if you will, the tone and the texture of the time brought to life through the voices of our players. Allow not this alternate timeline of history to offend us. We know well the truth and valour of the screaming eagles in the Ardennes, their defence against the fearful Hun. But just suppose for a moment within the girdle of these walls we now confine two mighty monarchies, England with three lions proudly emblazoned upon the chest and uh, Germany whose high up reared and abutting fronts the perilous narrow channel parts asunder. Peace out your perfections with your thoughts into a thousand parts. Divide but one man. Think when we talk of tanks that you see them printing their proud track on the receiving earth. For it's in your thoughts that must now see our soldier carry them here and there, jumping over the mines, landing on the blood-soaked beaches of Normandy. Picture the bunkers, smell the gunfire. Turn the accomplishment of many years into but an hourglass or two with a five minute interval. Allow us to tell this history and upon your humble patience, we pray gently to hear Kindly to judge our very simple play. My God, this treaty that is being proposed from our allies is the same as the one proposed during the First World War. But how, my Lord, can we resist it now? We must sign this treaty or go to war. If we sign, we will be ruled by Europe. The state will lose half of what it now possesses. Well, this treaty strips us of lands, laws and titles. Our parliament, in its attempt to support the war effort, needs to pay some 15 extra divisions, 1,500 new tanks and 6,200 officers to be trained, and further money to support the military gentry and those two poor and, and too weak and sick to fight. Mm. That is the cost of this invasion alone, if we do not sign the treaty. That would drink deep. Or oh, that would drink cup and all. And how do you suppose we pay for this? We cannot stretch military funding or the cost of munitions. Food is already being rationed. Well, with an invasion, of course, we must convince the king and the people that a strong offence is the greatest defence. So, I have chosen General Henry Monmouth to lead the invasion. He is full of grace and fair regard. Mm, very good, my lord. He is respected by the troops and truly loved by the king. Now, the king would never have agreed to this in his youth. But now, with the scars of the blitz still fresh in our minds, our king has lost some of that honesty and compassion. We are blessed in this. I find Henry a very capable general. He is a great leader of men. Uh, but my lord, will the king take the risk of pulling our fragile alliance into another Dieppe? He seems indifferent, swaying more upon our plan than against the king. And I have made him an offer in regards to this invitation of France, that it will raise the greatest sum from war than ever seen before. How did he receive your offer, my lord? With good acceptance, I believe. In agreement with our allies, I've brought out some ownerships of certain uh, dukedoms and artefacts and wealth that Germany now possesses that lie within the heart of France. When do we meet with the ambassador? Uh, the ambassador is coming to the war room at four o'clock. Well, my lord, it is four o'clock now. Well, then call in the general and his lieutenants to hear the proposal. As for the spoils of war, do not dwell on the subject. I am sure the French will agree to this invasion, as they are so keen to be rid of the German occupation. 
Mm. I will follow your lead, but I'm eager to hear the details of these spoils of war for myself. Prime Minister Churchill, Field Marshal Montgomery, this is my first officer, Lieutenant Exeter, and my liaison officer, Lieutenant Westmoreland. Gentlemen, shall we call in the ambassador? General? Uh, not yet. Before we hear him, we need to make clear some things of weight concerning the army's role in this proposed invasion of France. Now, may God and his angels guard you. Good evening, gentlemen. Sure, we thank you. My learned lord, please proceed as to unfold as to why the underground forces in France should or should not consent to this invasion. God only knows how many shall spill their blood when we unsheath our sleeping sword of war. Never did two such kingdoms so full of blood be so eager to spill each other's. My lord, we should hear your understanding of the situation. Then hear me and your peers that the king and I give you the right to invade France, take back Europe from Germany, with the understanding that all recovered artefacts, weapons and valuables shall become the property of the state. For your part, being charged with the invasion of the realm of France, by our law shall give you the right to seize any and all assets for the war effort. Uh, very good, my lord, but do we have the right and consent from the French to claim these assets? And the sin upon my head, be it. When a man dies in war, make the inheritance descend unto the state. When we win this war, England shall rule the whole of Europe. And so, stand for your own country. Unwind our bloody flag. Look back to your mighty ancestors and invoke a warlike spirit. Defeat the full axis of power in France and all of Europe is ours. We are the noble English. We will win this campaign and take the beaches of Normandy. We will fight them on the beaches. Never give up. Never surrender. Awake your remembrance of these valiant dead from the first war. The blood and courage that renowned in them runs in your veins. The time to attack is now. Churchill here has the details of the invasion, a most mighty of endeavours. We all expect that we should rouse ourselves, as did the former lions of our blood. We know we have cause and means and might. Never has a general been better loved and had more loyal soldiers than Henry. With blood and sword and fire, we win the right. The mighty British Empire, along with our allies, have raised you an almighty army, the likes of which have never been seen before. Yes, gentlemen, but we must not only arm to invade France. We must also make preparations to defend at home. Germany will surely take all advantages if we move so many troops at once. There shall be a wall sufficient to defend the first wave, provided by the American Air Force, Operation Overlord. I see. And by boat, the Americans shall land at two beaches, Omaha and Utah. The Canadians primarily at Juneau and our own British blood on sword and gold. Never before have we gone in with such force. When we invade France, we put at risk the lives of all nations. Including the French civilians, my lord. When all our chivalry has been in France and left nothing but widows, Europe will thank us for its freedom. There's a saying, a proverb, very old but true. Once the eagle England being in prey, to her unguarded nest the weasel comes, playing the mouse in absence of the cat. It follows then that the cat must stay at home. But we have locks to safeguard such things, and petty traps to catch the petty thieves. Still, I am concerned. How will we be received upon landing in France? In government, it is your job to conjure up moral reasons for the war. Therefore, I say, the heavens divide, the state of man divide. Obedience to your country and sacrifice of whomever is in our way for the freedom of all men. We are the sad-eyed executioner of justice. Our actions must end in one purpose. If we do not act now, the enemy will grow too strong. Very well. Call in the ambassador. But now we are well resolved. 
By God's help, Germany will be defeated. We'll bend it to our needs or break it all into pieces. Our history shall be full of courageous acts, gentlemen, or else our, or else our graves will tell a different story. Now, Ambassador, we are well prepared to know the pleasure of our cousin, Germany. I understand you bring a message from our self-promoting Reich Marshal Hermann, and not from the Führer himself. Shall we hear his terms for surrender, perhaps? Do you wish to hear the message in full? We are not tyrants, and therefore with frank plainness. Tell us the German's mind. In answer to your claim, our good Reichsmarschall bid you be advised there's nothing in France that can be won. And he calls for you and your allies to either surrender or join with us against the true enemy of us all, the Russians. He sends you this gift and desires to hear no more from little England. This and more insults my Reichsmarschall speaks. What gift is that? A set of balls. Tennis balls, sir. Ball the dash. <laughs> we are glad your Reich Marshal is so pleasant with us. When we have matched our rackets to these balls, we shall in France play a set that shall strike his Führer hard. He has met his match with us. Tell him I will rise up in such full glory that it will strike his Luftwaffe blind. You can convey to him that this mockery of his has turned his balls to gunstones and his soul will pay for it. For it will mock mothers from their sons, mock bunkers from his fortified beaches. Tell the Reich Marshal his jest is of low wit, when thousands did weep more than did laugh at it. Convey the ambassador to the aerodrome with safe conduct. Gentlemen, Make core preparations for invasion. All divisions soon collected and SOA operations set in motion. And more feathers upon the wings of our mighty air armada. Let every enlisted man be given his orders. Operation Overlord and Normandy shall by foot, air and sea be fought. Now all the youths of England are on fire. Now thrive the armourers, and honour lies in the breast of every man, following blindly like all good soldiers. For now sits expectation in the air, and hides our sword from hilts and from point. The Germans, devised by good intelligence, of this most dreadful preparation shake in their boots and seek to divert the England. Oh, England! Model to thy inward greatness, thy little body with mighty heart. But the three corrupted men, Cambridge, Grey, and Scroop, these men have conspired with the fearful Germans, and by their deeds must die for treason. The sum is paid, the traitors are agreed. A general is set from London. And the scene is now transported, gentles, to Southampton. There is the playhouse now. There must you sit, and thence to France shall we convey you safe, and bring you back, charming the narrow seas to give you gentle pass. For, if we may, we'll not offend one stomach with our play. Good well, morning, Lieutenant Bardolph. What, are you pistol now, mates, again? For my part, I care not. I say little, but when times are tough, I smile. Be that as it may, I dare not fight, but I will hold my own. I'm a simple but skilled man. I can toast cheese on the end of me bayonet. Helps me endure the cold. I'll buy you breakfast if you and pistol be mates again. We'll be free sworn brothers when we ship out to France. Come on, Corporal Nim. I will live as long as I may. That is for certain. When I cannot live any longer, I will take my eternal sleep. That's the rendezvous of it. It's French, I'll have you know. It's certain, Corporal Nim, that Pistol is now married to Nell Quickly. And certainly, she did you wrong. 
you were in love with her, were you not? I cannot tell. Things may be as they may. Men may sleep, and they may have their throats about them at the time. And I have a very sharp boot knife here somewhere. And I have patience. Here comes ancient pistol and his wife could corporal. Be patient now. Oh, now me old mate, pistol, how are ya? Base tyke. You trying to wind me up? Now by this hand, I swear, I'll scar you. No more, listen up, you gang of bloody freewheelers. No more shall my now be taking lodgers. No, by my honour. Well, not for long anyway. For I cannot lodge and board a dozen honest women who live by their wits. For it be thought we keep a baldy house. Good, Lieutenant. Corporal, there's nothing here to get upset about. Pish! Pish. <laughs> Pish on you, Iceland dog. You pricky and curl of Iceland. <laughs> Good Corporal Nim, show your valour and put your knife away. Will you shog off? <gasps> I will have your soul. Soul, egregious dog. Oh, vile viper, my soul in your face. My soul in your teeth, on your throat and in your hateful lung. Yeah, down your throat and worse. Out your nasty mouth. I'll push my soul out your bowels. I can take you. Pistol's cock is upright and flashing fire will follow. I'm no cur. You can't take me. You know what? I've got good reason to knock you right out. If you grow foul with me, Pistol, I'll stab you with my knife. I'll cut your brains out just to make me laugh. <laughs> Is that with the bayonet you towed your cheese on, you vile bastard? I'll kill you. Your grave is gaping wide. And death, oh, it's near. So take your last breath, Sonny Jim. Hear me? Hear what I say? Hear the strife of first blood? I'll cut him up as I am a soldier. Oh, I'll buy my oath as a soldier. I'll offer you my hand and my fury's done. Give me a fist. Come on. Ain't you got a fighting spirit? I will cut thy throat by my honour as a soldier. But not today. <laughs> Couple of gorge. Is that the word you use in French? Was bloody slit in your throat. I defy you again. You are a hound. You think you're going to take my wife? Oh, do you love my wife? Tough. She's mine. Oi! Don't you spit at me. I'll put you in the hospital. Now quickly, he's mine. All right, that's enough. Are we done? Hey, Pistol, you must come quick. It's me old man, Sir John. He's asked for you now. Oh, Bardolph, he wants to see your face too. Oh, he's really sick in bed. Oh, I, I fear Captain Falstaff is at death's door. Oh, my God. Stone the crows. <gasps> General Henry. Oh, this will break his heart. Good husband, fetch him quick. Come on, I'll make you two friends. We must go to France together. Why the devil should we have knives on each other's throats, huh? Yeah, yeah, no, you're right, all right, yeah. Let war kill us, because, well, we'll be friends in this foul time, I suppose. You'll pay me the eight shillings I want off your betting. Base is the slave that pays. Now that I will have, or no deal. <laughs> By my manhood. I've had enough of this. Come on, let's go. Put him up. Put him up. Abide my bayonet. He that makes the first thrust. I'll kill him by this sword. I will. By your sword, that is an oath. An oath that makes me broken. Corporal Nim, will you be friends? If you will not, why then be mine enemy as well with me too. Now, please, fight or shut up. I shall have my eight shillings. I want off your betting. Oh, yeah, all right. I'll pay now in liquor, all right? I've got some left here somewhere. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you in friendship and brotherhood. I'll live by Nim and Nim shall live by me. Oh, whatever. I shall, in whatever I steal, I'll give to you, all right? Just give me your hand. Just make up. I shall have my money. All right, in cash. Most honestly paid. Well, then, that's it. You never listen to me. Come in quickly to Sir John. My poor heart. He is so shaken with a fever. 
It is so sad to be old. The sweet men come to him. The general Henry's a good man, but he said some bad things about his old drinking buddy. Nim, you've spoken it right, son. His heart is fractured and it's now broken. Like I say, the general is a good man, you know? But really, the things he said, that's what killed him. Well, then, let's go and say our condolences to the old fucker, shall we? Like lambs, we shall live. Go to the bleeding slaughter, I suppose. For God's sake, I can't believe the general trusts these traitors. They shall be apprehended now we know who the spies are. How smooth they act, and they swear loyalty to the crown. Thankfully, an interception was sent to us by the resistance. These men were our allies. But now, should they sell our lives into to a foreign power? Court martial is too good for their treachery. Welcome, Captain Cambridge and my good friend, Captain Scroop. Gentlemen, please, give me your thoughts. Do you not think our powers will cut through the forces in France? Do you not think it's able to execute the plan? Oh, for which we are, of course, all assembled here. No doubt, General, if each man does his part. I have no doubt, since we are well-armed and carry our hearts upon our sleeves. And, of course, we need every man to succeed in the defeat of the enemy. Oh, well, never was there a better leader more love than you, sir. There's not a soldier alive that sits in fear on your leadership. Well, we therefore have great cause to be thankful for the men we have assembled here today. Let each man be judged upon his merit and according to the worthiness of his actions. So shall we all, with steel hearts and refreshed hope, do our services. We expect no less. Oh, Lieutenant Exeter, go and uh, fetch the soldier that committed the offence upon me yesterday. Private Gray, the one who attacked me. Oh, we thought at first it was an excess of wine. It had just set him off a little. I was just about to pardon him. But, <laughs> but, but... Give me your counsel, Cambridge and Scroop. What do you consider we should do with Private Grey? Do not to be merciful, sir. I say let him be punished. Make an example of him. Let us not be merciful. No, 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 no. General, please, court-martial him and punish him to take off a limb while you're at it. General, you show too much mercy if you pardon him. Please, let him taste my correction. <laughs> you think too much of me. You are too heavy-handed against this poor wretch. His small faults are simply made from his temper. So should we not be kind to this man? Or how then shall we act when proper, capital crimes are committed? Cambridge and Scroop both would have him punished. Are you the late commissioners here, gentlemen? I am, sir. You asked me to join you here. You also have summoned me here just yesterday, sir. Yes, of course, some uh, new orders are needed. Cambridge, there is yours, and there yours. Scroop, read them. And know I know your worthiness. Is there a problem, gentlemen? General, this is... Uh, clear this papers. Is great, uh, so uh, much general, completely false. This is false information. Oh, look how their faces <laughs> change. Why, what do you read there that has caused the blood to drain from you? I do confess my fault, sir, and I do beg your forgiveness. I beg of you, General, show us some mercy. The mercy that was quick in us is by your own counsel cut off and killed. Do not therefore shame to talk of mercy. For your own reasons you have turned as dogs upon their master. I thought you noble, Cambridge, but to have turned so freely. And you, Scroop, how I respected you. These here are the letters that you sent through the German spy network that did for a small price, I might add, conspire to reveal our plan. What shall I say to you, Captain Scroop? You cruel, ungrateful, savage and inhuman creature. You that had all my counsels. And here in black and white, treason. If I pardon you now, then we have already lost this war. Arrest them. They will answer to the law for their crimes. And only God will save their souls. 
No, no. I arrest you for high treason by the name of Lieutenant Cambridge. And I arrest you for high treason by the name of Captain Scroop. I repent my fault more than my death and I beg your forgiveness and let my life pay the price for it. You will hear your sentence in court martial. You have conspired against our royal army. Joined with an enemy, you would have sold your king to slaughter, his subjects to oppression, and the entire United Kingdom into desolation. No, please. You must answer please. to the letter of the law. General. Get them out of my sight. Take them away. It was all Scroop's idea. General. Move it, Scott! Move it! Move it now! Double quick time! Thank you, Exeter. Now, men, to the revised plan for the invasion of France. Needless to say, this new enterprise is for your eyes only. Thanks be to God that we brought to light this dangerous treason lurking in our way. Take these new orders and assign your officers well. Now may our war advance. For king and country, we invade the realm of France. Yes, General. Oh, you got your papers. Oh, honey, sweet husband. Let me bring you to Staines. Bring me to Staines? I can't afford you. Aren't you 50 quid a go? Jesus. No! Although my manly heart does yearn for it, I'm not mad my own wife. Jesus. Right. Bardos! For blighting him. Raise your spirits, my son. Boy, give those glasses a good polish and brussel up your courage. For Captain Falstaff, he is brown bread. God bless him. So I must now lead, you sorry men. I wish I were with him, wherever he is, either in heaven or in hell. I'm sure he's not in hell. He's in Arthur's bosom, if ever man went to Arthur's bosom. Yeah. He parted between 12 and 1, even at the turn of the tide. And as I see him fumble the sheets and smile, I knew there was one way out. How are you now, Sir John? I, I said. And he cries out, God, God, God. And I said, you do not think of God. There's no need for such thoughts. So I put my hands into the bed and I felt his feet and they were stone cold. I moved up to his knees and they were stone cold. And And afterwards I went and everything was as cold. It's any stone. You what? They say he cried out for drink. Aye, that he did. And for women? No, that he did not. <laughs> yeah, he did, and said they're all devils. Oh, I could never stand the way he did speak about women. He said once that the devil would take him disguised as a woman. <laughs> and indeed he did in some ways. The, the way he did handle them. But he was also romantic and called us all the whores of Babylon. Oh, bless him. <laughs> Do you not remember how he lovingly called women black souls burning in the fires of hell? Well, the fuel has gone out and maintained that fire and his stories are all we got left of him. <sighs> Wonderful. Oh. Nim, shall we get off then? Yeah. Yeah. I was just thinking, should we get off? Because they're going to soon close up the base in Southampton. And that'll basically mean no more leave till we embark for Europe. (laughs) You're not wrong, my son. Come, let's away, my love. Give me your lovely little lips. Come here. That's enough of that. Oh, she's wearing a top. I couldn't see one over the shoulders. (laughs) Now, listen. When we are gone, trust no one, all right? Because their oaths are made of straw. Mary don't fight, a wafer cakes and dogs. So, my little feather chickety duck. We go as fellows in arms to France, Greece, Italy. Where we land, we'll be like leeches, my boys, to suck the food and the very blood of that rich land. They say that's some unwholesome food. <sighs> That's my soft mouth now. One more time as we must march. Um... Oh, we're not for that. Farewell, hostess, now. I cannot kiss. Not by my humour, but add you. A good housework you'll be while we are gone. Keep yourself closed, and I'm talking about your knees. 
Oh, and this war, it will be over in less than a year, I believe. No, all right. Adieu, babes, adieu. Oh, farewell, sweet family. Farewell, adieu. Hello, America. Adieu, bonjour. Bonjour. So, the English with full power are upon us. Our spies are concerned that there is an invasion plan. What do we have by means of defenses? I have requested reinforcements to be sent directly to the sea border. We must fortify every town. Report to me what you have done with your men and armory. The English approach with fierce forces. We should fear this, as fear may teach us to be prepared, and it may be fatal to neglect the English. I must have doubted we are, we are already armed against the foe. In war, defenses and preparation should be maintained in expectation of an invasion, but let us do it with no show of fear. We heard that England is full of decrepit old modest dancers. <laughs> <laughs> you are far too much mistaken in this, General. The great state of England is in fact well supplied. Our spy in England has stated there is a large gathering of troops towards the coast of England. I fear there may be a greater plan. Well, is it so, Heinrich, or you just think it's so? <clears throat> it is no matter. In defense, it is best to evade the enemy more mighty than he is, so that my preparations for defense are filled. Do we think this General Henry Strong? He is born out of the bloody strain that haunted us in the First World War, no? We have received a communication from the Churchill of England in answer to our treaty. What does he say? Perhaps a final chance to sign the treaty? Nein. Turn your head and stop pursuit. You act like cowardly dogs are not at the first sign of danger. Take a shot at the English and let them know what a mighty army we have. You are the head of the snake. Self-love is not so vile a sin as self-neglect. No. What is the message from England? He greets you, my Führer. He wills you abide by the law of nations and the, dec the decree from the crown of England. He, uh, <clears throat> he bids you surrender. <laughs> <laughs> or what else follows? <laughs> Bloody constraint. In a fierce tempest is he coming. In thunder and earthquake like a jove. This hungry war opens its jaws and upon your head rest the widow's tears and the orphan's cries and the dead man's blood. This is his claim, his <laughs> threatening message. I desire nothing more than the defeat of England. Tomorrow shall you know my mind in full. We will dispatch the forces to the sea border immediately, my fellow. Nine, nine. We shall dispatch forces when conditions are in our favor. Hmm. One night is short. What can they do in just one night? <laughs> Us. With imagined wing, our swift scene flies. In motion of no less celerity than that of thought. Suppose you have seen the well appointed general at Hampton Pier embark his royal ship and his brave fleet. Play with your fancy, and in them behold. Upon a hempel tackle, ship boys climbing. Here's a shrill whistle, big stuff or to give. The sounds confused. Behold the shredden sail, born with the invisible and creeping. For oh, the huge bottom fills the world's sea, breasting the lofty surge. Oh. Do but think, you stand upon the ravage and behold a city on the inconstant billows dancing. For so appears this fleet majestical, 
holding due course to Normandy. Follow. Follow. Grapple your minds to steerage of this navy. As you leave your England behind, as dead midnight steer, guarded by grandeurs and babies and old women, is a past not arrived. Peace and waste on Oh, I see. This gin has got some rich that one pairing has. It will not follow this cold and dry strong cavalier's defense. Work. Work your thoughts in there and see a siege. All the ordinances on their carriages. With fatal mouths gaping on girded Normandy. With Linstock now, the devilish cannon touches and down goes all before them. Still be kind. Leak out that performance with your mind. Once more onto the breach, dear friends, once more! We'll close the wall up with our English dead! In peacetime, there is nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness and humility. But, when the blast of war blows in our ears, imitate then the action of a tiger. Stiffen your sinews, summon up your blood, disguise fair nature with hard favoured rage. Now set the teeth and stretch the nostril wide. Hold on your breath, and then every spirit up to his full height. On, on you noblest English. Is honor not your mothers? Now attest that those who called fathers did beget you, be copying out a men of grosser blood, and teach them how to war. And you, private, whose limbs were made in England, show us here the metal of your pasture. Let us swear that you are worth your breeding, which I doubt not. For there is none of you so mean and base there has not a noble luster in your eyes. Their game's afoot. I see you stand like greyhounds in a slip, waiting up on the start. Follow your spirit, and on this next charge, cry God for Henry, England, and St. George! England and St. George! Company! Move it! Move it! Move it! Move it! on the left flank! Bunk on the left! Flank! To the left flank? Tell the captains it's no good here either! There are no good directions! We are overwhelmed! Captain Gloucester, to whom the order of the assault was given, is directed by the Irishman, a very valiant soldier! Oh, Captain Matoris is not! Uh, I think so! I think he is an ass! He has no more discipline in the, in the disciplines of war than a puppy dog! Well, here he comes! And the Scots captain, Jamie, and Captain uh, McMorris with them. Captain Jamie is a marvellous gentleman, that is certain, and of great knowledge in the war. He has the most experience of any military man in the world in the disciplines of war. Lefty fucking me, boys. Ready for a fight, Captain Foran? Good day to you, good Captain James. Captain McMorris, have you quit the bunker left flank? What new orders? Well, my Christ, I'm done! The work on that night was so tough that I nearly started a retreat. In my heart, I swear the work is not done. I would have never thought all of Normandy to save us from that onslaught. 
Captain McMorris, I will relieve you of that left flank. Just say the word. Oh, it is no time for discourse. The day is hot in weather and in war, and the general wants us to preach that their tone, and you talk, and you do nothing. Leave on us all. Ah! In my hand, there is work to be put and work to be done. Captain McMorris, I think you need some correction. There are not many of your nation left now. My nation? What is my nation? Huh? You villain? You bastard? You toffee? Tell me who talks of my nation, huh? What is my you nation? You mean it like that, Captain McMorris. I think you do not know what you are doing, and your lack of discipline will get us all killed! Uh, I do not know you. I, for Christ's sake, if you talk to me like that again, I will cut off your head! Yeah, dumb man, you stop! Oh. You mistake each other! Calm down! Oh, Christ alive, boys! That's a foul foe! Oh, that sounds like the strong point's been taken. Captain McMorris, when there is better opportunity, I will tell you that I know the disciplines of war, and there is an end of it. Uh, and now yet fares the governor of this town. This is the end for you. Therefore, give yourselves up. I know you are proud men, but if you defy us once more, many men will suffer. I give you my word, as I am a soldier, that we will spare your lives. But if I am forced to begin the battery once again, I swear, as I am a soldier, a name I feel that defines me well, that I will not leave your town until in her ashes she lies buried. The gates of she shall be all shut up, and the violence yourselves will have caused. Therefore, men of lyon sur mer Take pity upon your town and on your garrison. While I am yet in command, no one shall be harmed. Will you yield and avoid further bloodshed? Our expectations are low. The division general that is in charge is not here. He is with his French mistress. Powers are not yet ready to resist so great a siege. Therefore, we yield our town and our lives to your mercy. Enter our gates. We can no longer defend our position. Open the gates! Exeter, take your men and enter. Fortify as well as you can. Be merciful to any prisoners. We'll retire here for a short while. This fight is not over. Tonight and here we are guests. And tomorrow, we must march on. Alice, you have been to England and uh, you know the language. <laughs> oh, we all, all peut, uh, yes, a little, madame. Alice, tell me. Oui? Tell you? Yes? What would you like to know, madame? Oh, uh, uh, I would indeed, I would love to know. The word the, for Luma? Lu, lu, the and, yes, we. Oui. Ah, we. Oui. Uh, les droits? Uh, les droits. Oh, good Lord, I forget. Uh, come on, the word for. Uh, it, will, it will come to me. Uh, les droits. Oh, I believe it is um, the fangre. Yes, we the fangra. La ma de and le droit de fangra. Oh, oui. I oh. think I am a very, I think I am a very apt student. No, oui. I have learned two words of English already. What is um, what is the word for les ongles? Les ongles. Uh, that is the Niles. The Niles. Oh, we listen. Yeah. Tell me if I'm saying it right. <laughs> the and the hunger and the Niles. Oh, we oui. oh, well done, madam. Yes? Excellent anglais. <laughs> Qu'est-ce que c'est? Uh, les anglais font la bras. 
the arm, madame. Elegon? Uh, the elbow. Debo! <laughs> Let me uh, practice all the words you taught me so far. Oh, I think it is too difficile, n'est-ce pas, madame? <laughs> Oh, mon ami, avec du divin. Allez, ça, listen, écoutez. De un, de fangre, de nail, de arme, de bilbo. De l'elbo, madame. Oh, Lord, I forgot. Dabo. Oui. What is, um, what is the word for... Le col? Oh, uh, that is the nick, madame. Le col? Qu'est-ce que c'est? The nick. The nick. Elemental? Oui. Uh, the chin. Ah, le col, the nick. Le menton? The chin. Ah! <laughs> Well, if I may say so, you pronounce the words just like a native Anglais speaker, are we? <laughs> I have no doubt. I will learn it. And in a short time, too, God willing. <laughs> now, you have not forgotten everything that you have just learned, huh? <gasps> no. I will recite it for you right now. The and the Hungra the nails. The nails, madame. Oh, that is what I said. The nails, the anna, the elbow. Oh, forgive me, the elbow. Oh, sacre bleu. That is what I said. The oui. elbow. And the nick and the skin. <laughs> ah, oui. Excellent. <laughs> Qu'est-ce que c'est le lia? Uh, what's for a uh, le pied? A le robe? Uh, the foot, uh -huh. madame, and um, uh, and the count. <clears throat> <laughs> the foot. And the count? <laughs> oh, Lord. Those are vulgar words. <laughs> Wicked, ugly, immodest. <laughs> not a fitting for respectable French girls to speak. No. <laughs> I would not utter those words for all the lords of France, for all the world. <laughs> Mon ami, le foot, le compte. <laughs> Nevertheless, I will recite my words I have learned one more time all together. Le arm, the fangra, the nail, the arm, the Ego, the nick, the sin, the foot, and the count. <laughs> oh, yes, you're excellent, madame, excellent. C'est trop chaud. Ah, oh, that is enough for one lesson. <laughs> Let's go to lunch. Oh, oui. It's certain now. The English have passed the river Seine. And if they move quickly, Commander, we cannot stay here in France. Let us quit all and give the vineyards to these barbarous people, or I'm sure they will destroy everything. Oh, God in him, shall we empty our luxuries and give up all our loots, all these wild, savage foots, and pack up so suddenly and leave with our tails between our legs? Norman bastards, bastard Normans. If the English march on us, I will not withdraw without a fight. Well, what would you have me do? Sell my two tents and live on a dirty farm out in the streets? The English. Courts of battle? Where have they found such metal? 
Is your climate not raw and foggy and dull where their sun looks pale and they drink bitter ale? Yeah. My honor in the fatherland, I will defeat them, English bastard warriors. The English say we have no honor or grace. They are hot on us, cowardly runaways. <laughs> I know. Where is Montjoy? Hmm? Call him in. Let him greet the English with sharp defiance. Sharper than your swords. Shame on you all. You let this general Henry of England sweep through our land, now painted with the blood of Normandy. Rush on them now, like an avalanche of snow from the Alps. You are poor enough, and we are forced to see Rohan. Bring him to us as our prisoner. My, my, my Fuhrer, his numbers are so few, and his men sick and famished from their march. I, 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 I am sure when he sees our mighty army, his heart will drop in fear. The armed victories in battle far their own. He will surely offer us his surrender. With haste, St. Mons joy, with a message, let him say to the English general, if he surrender now, we shall spare his life. You shall stay with us. No, 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 my fear, please, I beg of you. Let me go and fight. Ah, mm, be patient, for you shall remain with us for now. Dispatch the messenger. Have him quickly bring us word of England's fall.
We have been redeployed to Bastogne, Belgium, to help our American allies. Here I have received intelligence on the location of a prisoner, Catherine, close friend to Charles de Gaulle, held somewhere at the Austrian-German border. If we can break through here at Bastogne and advance through Luxembourg, we may be able to save it. The intelligence whispers of a ceasefire in the prison. If this next battle can be won, we shall break the back of this bloody war. And only then can we strike a bargain with Germany. What? How now, Captain Fruellen? Have you come up from the bridge? Oh, I assure you, there is a very excellent military operation set up on the bridge. Is Lieutenant Exeter and his company safe? Well, Lieutenant Exeter has survived, although I think he has lost half his regiment. In honour and duty, I owe him my life. Well, he held the bridge most valiantly. There is no braver Lieutenant. Oh, though I thought I saw uh, fighting alongside him this man. What's his name? Uh, he is called Pistol. I don't know him. Captain, Captain, can, can you do me a favour? Lieutenant Exeter is your friend, is he not? Oh, I and I praise God, he is mine too. <laughs> That's good news, because, well, Bard off and Nim, you know, and they're both like a drink. Both soldiers, firm and sound of heart, have by some cruel fate and fortune. Oh, <laughs> by your patient, ancient pistol. Now, fortune is blind. In truth, I know a poet makes an excellent description of it. What is it now? Uh, fortune is a reward for good morals. Well, no time for poets now, Captain, but fortune is their foe and frowns upon them. They have gone to the town and purchased, or, well, <laughs> a better word for it might be stole, <laughs> some small things, very small. And now they face court martial, all things, and they might be hanged, both down to death. Please, I beg you, let the men go free. Exeter, he's off his nut. He's given the order. If you speak to him, Captain, for the life of Bard off and him, or after all, we need every man we can get, right? 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 Well, Pistol, I do understand. Oh, yeah. thank you then, Captain. Thank you so no, much. No, wait, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. Uh, now, uh, dis there ought to be some sort of discipline used, so... Uh, what did they steal? Oh, it was just some candles, you know. Huh. They might have been, well, they might have been attached to some gold holders. <laughs> but, you know, um, and there was a robe just to keep them warm. I mean, it's brass monkeys out here. It's freezing. I mean, it may have been a ceremonial robe, but who could tell? I mean, they nicked it all from the church, you see, at the time. What? No way. You'd better get out of here before your court martial just for being his friend. Robbed the church? Oh, did I say my friend? No, no, no. <laughs> I thought I'd be down for my friendship to them. But, you know, they were good men once, but, you know. Oh, what, just the once? <laughs> Why, this is an arrogant rascal. I remember him now. <laughs> he fought at the bridge. Oh, I assure you, I did, although I didn't see him fight very much, but he did utter some brave words. drink fueled, I imagine. <laughs> He's a fool that goes to war so that when he returns to London, he can call himself a soldier and tell stories of how bravely he fought and how he defeated the enemy with ale-washed wits and gin-soaked courage. Now, now, I tell you what, Captain Gower, he's a braver man than you would think, you know. He would gladly show the world the holes in his coat, although they're made from neglect and not from fighting. <laughs> oh. Oh. Good day, General, sir. That is, man. Llewellyn, have you come from the bridge? Aye, sir. Lieutenant Exeter has gallantly taken and held the bridge, sir, although Exeter has suffered some heavy casualties. And what men have you lost, Llewellyn? Oh, I think we have lost half of the men, and two that are likely to be executed for robbing the church. Uh, Lieutenant Bardolph and Captain Nim, if you know the men. We would have all such offenders court-martialed immediately. And I give express charge that in our marches through this country, there be nothing stolen from any of the villages, nothing taken that is not paid for, and none of the French abused. Certainly, sir. You know me by my name, sir. I am messenger of the German general, sir. Well, I know you. What shall I know of you? Uh, my general's mind. Very well. <laughs> Unfold it. It says to Henry of England, though we seem dead, we did but sleep. Advantage is a better soldier than rashness. We could have beaten you at Normandy, but you took us by surprise. England shall repent for this cowardly warfare. Therefore, 
consider a surrender and repay losses we have borne. You have lost a number of your troops and cannot continue to push forward. To this, he adds defiance and says, you have betrayed your soldiers and condemned them to death. What is your name? What's Joyce, sir? Well, count yourself lucky that we live by a saying in England. Never shoot the messenger. So I'll turn you back to your master with this. Tell your commander I am here. My surrender will be in my death. Tell him we will march on, and we will let no one stand in our way. I shall deliver this message. Thank you, General. I hope they will not come upon us now. The men are so weak and unfed, General. We are in God's hands, brother, not theirs. March to the bridge and beyond the river. We march until we reach the town of Bastogne. Aye, sir. This French wine will never be better than good fashioned fathers and beer. But gentlemen, as I was saying, my unit is the best military unit in the world. <laughs> you have an excellent unit. It's saying about your wine cellar. But look for look for the half it's due. Bah, it may be the best in Europe, but where is it now? Mm. Would it never be morning? Oh, uh, you and Heinrich, you talk of your unit in the Luftwaffe in the same place? Mm. You have served in both, I've noticed, and risen fast to the highest distinctions, you ask, Kissa. <laughs> Long nights, it says. Oh, will it ever be day? Oh, oh my God. <coughs> oh. Man, your manners, Herman. Oh, oh tomorrow. <laughs> oh, I will not trade my place with any man tonight. Oh, I bounce on the ass like Pegasus, and I saw like a hawk. The earth sings under my feet. Oh, I think you are drunk, Herman, for Pegasus is a horse. Feel the peace, Pegasus, is pure air and fire. I am indeed a horse. Indeed, General. A most excellent horse. Yes, no more, no more. I once, I once had a song about this. Mine are done. Mine are Nine. Uh, I've heard the songs uh, you make for your mistress. <laughs> I compose it for my men. In that time, my men are my mistress. Yes, well, I hope you'll keep your men in line as well as you do your mistress. I rule over my men as I do my mistress. I fear, Herman, you may have one more battles in the bedroom than in the field. Oh, your cars in bedroom, battles in the bedroom, Heinrich, because you have to fight with the units that God gave you. But I have won many in the fields and many treaties in the bedroom. <laughs> Gentlemen, you speak too much, I think. Heinrich, the uniform that I saw in your tent, are those stars or suns on it? Ugh. Stars, of course, and the Iron Cross. Some of those yeah. stars will fall tonight, I think. <laughs> well, unlike some sitting here, I have earned every star. That may be, Heinrich, but is it not so that you were appointed to command by connection of experience, yeah? Well, have we both not profited from our relationship to the Führer? I... As his loyal friend. What a long night it is. When will it be day? Tomorrow the locks are about the fields and my way shall be paid with English faces. Is it not so? We have far more soldiers than the enemy. Tomorrow we cannot lose. I will not say this, Herman. Out of fear that I may be proved wrong. But tomorrow I will walk amongst the English. Hold my knife, cut their ears from their head, and shout, Do you hear me now? 
mind God, you almost shout as much as Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> Who will make a bet with me? By noon, I will have 20 prisoners. 40 Deutschmarks, I have 30. Noon. Oh, it is midnight, gentlemen. I will go arm myself. Good night, Herman. Good night, you lightweight. <laughs> Herman longs for morning. He longs to destroy the English, but he never talks of specific battles that I have ever heard of. Nor will he do any of the killing himself tomorrow. He will leave that to his soldiers and keep his uniform clean. Yeah, yeah. Does he have any battle experience to have been promoted so fast by his boyfriend? Nine. Herman is a very old friend of the Führer. <laughs> yes, uh, I know what you mean by old friend. I've heard that before. Mm -hmm. They say there is flattery in friendship. And uh, better the devil you know, yeah? Skozeni, mm -hmm. <laughs> the English, the light was only 1,500 paces of our camp. Schreinerhund! They do not long for the morning as we do. What a wretched race the English are. Yeah. <clears throat> if the English had any apprehension, they would turn and run away. Schnell! <clears throat> I agree with you. If their heads had any intellectual thought, they would not wear such heavy helmets, yeah? <laughs> that tiny island of England, it breeds very headstrong creatures with mm. unmatchable courage. But they still cannot see when they are beaten by a mightier force. Yes, like next Tuesday, I think. It would be foolish for us to run from them into the mouth of the Russian bear. They are fleas that hang upon the lip of a lion. Yeah, yeah, this is true. But the Englishmen, they are rough and they leave their wits with their wives who cook great meals of boiled beef. Then they eat like starving wolves and fight like mad blind devils. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they use this beef for like drapes in the window. And they are surely out of beef now. <clears throat> and tomorrow we will find they only have stomachs to eat and not to fight. Now is the time to arm ourselves. Yeah, it is now two o'clock, but let us see by ten. We shall each kill a hundred Englishmen. For the fallen land. <laughs> Now, entertain conjecture of a time when creeping murmur and the pouring dark fills the wide vessel of the universe. From camp to camp, through the foul womb of night, the hum of either army stilly sounds, that the fixed sentinels almost receive the whispers of each other's watch. Fire answers fire. And through their paley flames, each battle sees the other's umbered face. Steed, threatened steed, in high and boastful nay, piercing the knight's dull ear. And from the tent, the armourers accomplishing the knights, with busy hammers closing with its eye, give dreadful note. The country cocks do crow, the clocks do toll, and the third hour of drowsy morning name. Proud of their numbers and secure in soul, the confident and over-lusty Germans do the low-rated English play at dice. And chide the crippled, tardy-gated knight, when like a foul and ugly witch doth limp so tediously away, the poor condemned English like sacrifices by their watchful fires, sit patiently and inly ruminate the morning's danger, and their gestures, sad, investing lank lean cheeks and war-worn coats, presenteth them unto the gazing moon so many horrid ghosts. Oh, nah, who will behold the royal captain of this ruined band, walking from watch to watch, from tent to tent, let him cry praise and glory on his head. 
Forth he goes and visits all his host, bids them good morrow with a modest smile, and calls them brothers, friends, countrymen. Upon his royal face there is no note, how dread an army hath him rounded him. Nor does he dedicate one jot of colour to the weary and all watch nigh. But freshly looks and overbears a taint, a cheerful semblance of sweet majesty. Let every wretch pine and pale before, holding him much comfort from his looks. Hard to see the bird to light the sun. Never I got to everyone. Dying cold fear that need and gentle all. Behold, is me unworthiness to find little touch of Henry in the night. And so are seen, must of the battle fly, where, oh for pity, we shall much disgrace with four or five most vile and ragged foils, right ill-disposed and cruel ridiculous, the name of Baston. Yet sit and see, minding true things by what their mockeries be. Erpingham. Erpingham, it is true that we are in great danger, but the greater therefore should our courage be. <laughs> God almighty, my friend, there is some soul of goodness in things evil, for our bad neighbour makes this morning ugly. Erpingham, I, I hope you've made a good bed for yourself. Yes, sir. These lodgings I like. I say now, I lie like a king. <laughs> My friend, it's good for men to love their pains, and then the mind is sharp and not a broken and drowsy grave. Please, lend me your cloak, Thomas. Apologies for the cold, my friend. Shall I attend to your uniform, sir? Uh, no, my good man. Go with my men to my tent. I wish to think a while, and I wish to be alone. Oh, sir. May the heavens bless thee, noble Henry. <laughs> God have mercy, old heart. <laughs> Thank you. You always speak so cheerfully. Who the bleed now goes there then, eh? eh? What friend. is your name? Friend. Oh, well talk to me then. Are you an officer or a commoner? Well, I'm the gentleman of a company. Oh, are you now? You carrying a weapon? Of course I am. Yourself? Well, I can see you are. Well, oh yeah, you blind. What's this? Pistol by name? Pistol! By nature! <laughs> well, then you consider yourself better with that weapon than um, a general, let's say. The general's a boarcock! <laughs> he's a heart of gold, he's a, he's a lad of life, an imp of fame. I love the lovely bully! <laughs> Do you want a drop of this? No, yeah? thank you. Oh, okay. It's only brandy, but actually it's not. It's my urine. I ran out of brandy weeks ago. <laughs> What's your name then? <laughs> Harry. <laughs> Harry Leroy. <laughs> Leroy? Oh, is, is that a Cornish name? You're part of that Cornish crew, are you? They're a bunch of pirates. No, no, I'm, I'm a Welshman. Oh, a Welshman. Uh, do you know Captain Flewellyn, do you? Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah, well, tell him. I'll knock his leak about his face upon St. David's Day. Well, you best make sure you have your pistol about you then, unless he ne he knocks his leak about your face. Yeah, that's easy for you to say. Are you his friend? Yes, and his kinsman too. <laughs> well, in that case, with all due respect, piss off to you as well, then. I have no quarrel with you, but I thank you anyway. I'll be on my way. Yeah, you best do that. Don't forget, I'm pistol boy name, pistol boy nature. Yes, it starts well with your fierceness. <laughs> Ho! Captain Fuellen! Hey! In the name of Christ, speak lower! This is the closest position to the front line that we can be! Do not give away our position! The enemy is loud, you can hear them from here! And if the enemy is an ass, a fool, and an idiot, and we are captured here, then should we not also be an ass, a fool, and an idiot? I will speak lower. I pray that you do, or else we may not live to see the morning. Though it appears a little out of fashion, there is much care and valour in you, Welshman. Brother Bates, 
Is that not the morning which breaks on the horizon? I think it is. But we don't have great cause to desire the approach of day. We will see the beginning of the day, but I think we shall never see the end of it. Who goes there? A friend. A friend. And what captain serve you? I'm the Sir Thomas Erpingham. A uh, good old commander and a most kind gentleman. What does he think of our chances tomorrow? He thinks the men are wrecked. They'll be washed off in the next tide. He has not shared his thoughts with the General. No, nor do I think he should. I personally think the General is just a man, as I am. All his senses are human. It's not as cold to him as it is to anyone. Therefore he fears the enemy, just as we do. The only difference being that he must not show his fears. For by showing them he would certainly dishearten his soldiers. He may show his outward courage, but I wish he was in the Thames up to his neck and I with him. Anything to escape that fate of tomorrow. Upon my honour, I will speak to my commander. I think the general would not wish himself anywhere but where he is. Then I wish he were here alone and that he would surrender so all the, these poor men's lives could be saved. I'm sure you don't wish any man to be here alone. I know myself that I would rather die here fighting than be at home hiding. There's more to this than we know. Aye, and more we should know. All we know is, we are the General's soldiers, and our service wipes out the crime. We're just following his bloody orders. But if the cause be wrong, the General himself has an heavy reckoning to make. When all those legs and arms and heads, blown off in battle, should join together at a later date and cry, we died at such a place. Some swearing, some crying for a surgeon, some upon their wives left behind, some upon their children. I'm afraid that there are few that die well that die in battle. Now if these men do not die well, it will be a black day for the general that led them to it. Well, so if the son of a fisherman is sent out by his father, out to sea in the boat six, by your rule it is the father's fault. Or if a servant is sent by out by his master to do some shopping and is attacked and killed by robbers, the master is to blame. The general is not bound to answer the particular endings of his soldiers, nor the father for his son, nor the master for his servant. None of us wished for death when we were sent to war. Now some may carry the guilt for the loss of friends, but now they are fighting two wars, the war outside and the war within their souls. A general is not, mark my words, not to be held in account for his fallen soldiers' deaths. Their duty is to king and country, and every soldier's soul and death is his own. It is certain that every man that dies, his death is on his own head, but the general is also to answer for it. I don't want him to answer for me, and yet here I stand, Ready to fight for him. I myself heard the general say that he would not surrender. Ah, he said so. To make us fight. But when our throats are cut, he may still surrender and we will still be dead. If I live to see it, I will never trust his word after. That's a perilous answer. You'll never trust his word after. That's a foolish thing to say. You dishonour your commander. I would be angry with you if the time were right. But we are overwhelmed with enough enemies already. Let it be a quarrel between us. If you live. Oh, it will be, I can assure you that. How shall I know you tomorrow? What's your name, soldier? Give me something of yours. I'll wear it in my uniform. Then, if I live, you will know me by it. And when I find you, I will make you an honourable man again. Here's a photo of my son. So you can explain my death to my son. Give me something of yours, if I live. I will find you when the battle is done. There's my glove. It has my initials inside the cuff. I wear this in my helmet. If you come to me after tomorrow and say, this, this is your glove, then by my hand I will show you the rights and wrongs of war. Well, if I live to see it, I will challenge you. you. Might as well be hanged now. I would do it now if we could spare the men. But we count on every life tomorrow. Keep your word. If we live, I'll be waiting. Be friends, you English fools. Be friends. We have Germans to fight, not each other. Good night to you, soldier. I hope it's not our last. Indeed. The Germans still outnumber us. Good night to you. I hope to see you again. Upon the general.
Let us risk our lives, our souls, our wives, and our, our children. All lay upon the head of the general. I must bear all, subject to the breath of every fool. What infinite heartache must a general feel that, a, that his men do not? What does a general have that his soldiers do not? Forget the ceremony and the medals and honour. What are they? Your ceremony, show me your work. What poison flattery. What sick and painful medal will I earn from this? Ceremony and praise for a job well done. Is that supposed to be a cure for this hellish nightmare? The chair that I sit on is full of thorns. I would give it all up just to sleep soundly as a slave. O oh God of battle, steal my soldiers' hearts. Take the fear from them now, O oh Lord. What more can I do? General. General. Your officers are searching throughout the camp to find you. Oh, good old friend. Collect them together at my tent. I'll be there shortly. I shall, sir. Look how the sun doth glint upon my proud phallic army! <laughs> Your army? The march them into the wind. My army is truly a magnificent sight. <laughs> oh, great, sir. Uh, will you be fighting on the front line today? I will fight only if you are field. Unstoppable, like a tank. <laughs> you think yourself bulletproof, then, huh? If the bullet is English, yeah. Uh, here comes the chief for the replacement army, Herr Hitler. Herr Hitler. Uh, Hitler. How you stand so proudly, gentlemen. I will move so fast that the English will not see me coming. They will not see us coming because their eyes will be blurred with the tears of failure. <laughs> <laughs> the English are on the move and trying to gain higher ground. To your positions, all units, straight to defensive positions. Let us make easy work of this poor and starved band of half-soldiers. Let them see us, so our mighty numbers shall suck away their souls, leaving them like empty husks or shells of men. There's not enough work but all of our hands, nor is there enough blood in all of their sticky veins to stain one right stripe upon our flag! Our approach shall so much scare the English, they will be forced to crouch down and yield! Shall we give them dinner and first uniforms and have to go fight for some? They are badly beaten already. Well, it's been fair. Nine! <laughs> I am awaiting my reinforcements, but I cannot wait any longer! To the battlefield! Come! Come away! The sun is high, and we outlive the day! Yum! <laughs> If we can take the ground here, we can break through to the town of Bastogne! And all our allies will be there to connect up with us! If we win here, we may turn the tide of the war! Oh, look how encircled we are! I'm afraid it can't be done! Oh, God! God be with you all! Oh. Where's the general? Where's the general? The general's gone to view the battlefield! He'll be back shortly! Ugh! Why do you want me to get 3,000 or more? That's done 5 to 1! And they're freshly fed and rested! Oh, Christ alive, me God's arm straight with us today! They're fearful odds! God be with you all. I'll get to my men. If we don't see you again, lads, I'll see you at the pearly gates. Westmoreland. Exeter, warriors all. Good luck, boys. Good luck to the lot of us. 
And what's he that wishes so? McMorris? No, my friend. For if we are marked to die, then the loss is for our country. And if we live, then the fewer men, the greater the share of honor. And I pray not one man more. But if it is a sin to have honor, then I am the most blaspheming soul alive. No, oh, by my faith, I do not wish one man more from England. In fact, let it be known throughout this army that he that has no stomach to this fight, let him depart. His passport shall be made and pay for convoy put into his purse. We would not die in that man's company that fears his fellowship to die with us. This day is called the Feast of Crispian. He that shall outlive this day and see old age will say, Tomorrow is St. Crispin's day. Then will he strip his sleeve and show his scars and say, These wounds I had on Crispin's day. And then shall all our names be remembered. Exeter, Westmoreland, Jamie, McMorris, Gower, Flewellyn, Good Erpingham. Everyone shall remember these names. Everyone shall raise their cups to these names. And all good men shall teach this story to their sons. And Crispin's day shall never go by. From this day to the ending of the world. But we in it will be remembered. We few. We happy few. We band of brothers. And he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Be you ne'er so vile. This day will gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England safely in bed. Will think themselves cursed that they were not here. Well, any speaks of those who fought with us upon St. Crispin's day! My general, gather your troops with speed. The Germans are in the battlefield and will charge on us at any moment. Will all things be ready if our minds be so? Perish the men whose mind is backward now. You do not wish help from, for England then? <laughs> With God's will, my general, you and I alone, without more help, could take this royal battle. Why now, you have unwished a whole thousand men. Good, I prefer it that way. We all know our positions. You know your places. God be with you all. General, here comes the dirty mouth of the Crouch himself, the messenger Montjoy. <laughs> For the last time, General Henry, I come for your surrender before your most assured overthrow, for it is certain you are near your end. Thousands need not die. Well, I tell you to send my former answer back. Let them kill me and then imprison my bones. Good God, why do they feel the need to mock us so? But the fool who tried to sell the lion's skin while the beast was alive was killed by you, the beast. And many of our bones shall no doubt find graves here. But let those, let those who leave their valiant bodies, will make them the heroes of this story. Now let me speak proudly. We are warriors of the working day. Our hearts are in the fight, and neither myself nor my soldiers will ever surrender. Now that to your general. I shall sir, and goodbye. I fear we shall never meet again. I fear you shall once more come to us and beg for peace. Now, soldiers, march away, and let us dispose of this most valiant day.
scattered men and extra they've killed our prisoners. All of them. What? Let every soldier kill his prisoners too. Oh God. Exit to give the order. The fleeing German have killed the boy and the prisoners. Especially against the war law of arms. This is the most arrogant piece of work that I ever did see. Is it not? It is certain the boy is not alive and the cowardly rascals that ran from the battle have done this slaughter. They have burned all to nothing, and so the general gives an order that each soldier must cut his prisoner's throats. Aye, well, he is a born killer, Captain Gower, like Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great? Did Alexander the Great not kill all of his prisoners of war? Our general is nothing like him. He never killed a single prisoner before. This is not well done for you. Now mark my words, he is not in his right wits or in good judgment. We cannot follow such an order. Here comes the general now. I was not angry since I came to France until this instant. Ride up that hill. Take a message to what remains of the Germans. If they surrender, tell them to come down to the field. If they will not, tell them we will cut the throats of those we have left. Show no mercy. Now go, tell them. Aye, sir. Here's the messenger for the Germans! What now? What do you want, messenger? We have bones to bury, and now you come to us for surrender! No, great general, I come to look to our dead, our captains, our soldiers. Great general, let us view the battlefield from the safety and collect our dead bodies. I will tell you the truth, messenger. I don't know if the day be ours or not. The day is yours. Yes! Praised be God. And not our strength for it. Moncho, what do they call this place? They call it Mont Bastogne. Then call this the Field of Bastogne. Mark it down for remembrance who fought here today, on the day of St. Crispin. All the water in the world cannot wash away the blood from Bastogne, I can tell you that. Exeter, go with him. Bring me the list of numbers dead on both sides. Llewellyn, call that soldier over here. Hey, boyo, soldier, come over to the general now. Soldier, well fought, well fought. Brito, why do you have a glove in your uniform? Please, you, sir, it's a gauge of one that I should fight. If he be alive. An Englishman? Yes, sir. The rascal that I crossed paths with last night. If he be alive, sir, I have sworn to box him in the year. 
or if I see the photo I gave him which he swore he would carry to remember me by. <laughs> what do you think, Captain Flewellen? Be, pray, be my counsel. Is it right that this soldier should keep his oath? Well, he can do nothing else. If he please you, General, in my opinion, I think these men should fight. Oh, careful, Flewellen. It may be his enemy is a gentleman of a high rank. Or as good a gentleman as the devil, but for honour, he should keep his oath. Then I bid you keep your vow, sir, when thou meet the fellow. So I will, General, as I live. Under whom do you serve? Under Captain Gower, sir. Ah, Gower is a good captain. Ah, please, give me the glove, soldier. I would look at it. Ah, but look, here is the other one with the matching initials, and is this not your photograph? Yes, it was myself indeed you promised to strike. What now, Williams? Shall we fight? All my offences, General, Perhaps. come from the art. I never meant anything that might offend you, sir. Yet it was our soldiers you were happy to offend. Uh, sir, you came to me not like yourself, not in uniform. You appear but as a common soldier. I beg your forgiveness. I forgive you. Your debt has been paid. But it was this photograph of your son that kept me going throughout this tragic day. The next time you face a dark night of the soul, remember this. Know that there is goodness in all men, even in your enemies. Now, Monjoy, pray tell, how are the dead numbered? He is the number of the slaughtered German army. What prisoners were taken and not killed? All our prisoners are accounted for, sir. Of officers Himmler surrendered and 15 soldiers. This report from Monjoy tells me that some 10,000 German uniforms lie in the field slain. The names of those will also not be forgotten. All men by rank that could be identified. 19,000 men killed in action since the beginning of this battle, sir. Oh, God. When all the history of battles was ever known, so great a loss as Bastogne. Sir, we must push forward from here to the Austrian-German border. We have new orders to take the high-ranking prisoner Himmler to Mount Kelstein. At the summit is the Third Reich building known as the Eagle's Nest. There we should find the last stronghold of the German army. Very good, Exeter. Assemble our best men. I hope to bargain for the release of a captive. Catherine of France? The battle is won, but we still have much to lose, my friend. American reinforcements will join us in two days. We must bring this war to an end and negotiate a ceasefire with Germany. Only then will there be a chance for peace in Europe once more. Vouchsafe to those that have not read the story that I may prompt them to admit the excuse of time, of numbers, and due course of things, which cannot in their hue be properly presented here. Now behold the great Mount Kelstein, and at its base, our band of brothers. At its peak, the eagle's nest. Here we see Henry sit upon his final throne. He must make a deal for peace and end this war, or all is lost and the world turned to stone. In this place, untouched by war, the exchange must unfold. Now turning towns and battlefields into a maid and stolen gold. Hi, Captain Fluellen. Why are you wearing a leak where your medal should be? Ah, is it St. David's Day today? There is occasion and cause in all things. I will tell you, my friend, the, the rascally lousy pistol, as a joke, prepared me some breakfast to eat on this St. David's Day. It was consisting entirely of raw leak. So... <laughs> I did swear I will wear a leek on my chest until I see him again, and I will make him eat raw leek. <laughs> ah, why, here he comes, swaggering like a turkey. 
Oh, it is no matter for his swagger, nor his turkey. Uh, good day to you, ancient pistol, you scurvy, lousy dog. Oh, you're the Welshman, are you not? Oh, uh, oh how was your breakfast, by the way? Oh, Jesus Christ, you need some mouthwash. I can smell the smell of stinky leek. <laughs> I see you prepare my food, you scurvy, lousy knave. So, to return the favour, I swore that I would find you and share my breakfast with you, this leek here. Mm, excellent vintage. I know your appetite and your digestion does not agree with it. Yet, as a mark of respect for St. David's Day, I would desire you eat it. Not for all the leeks in Wales. <laughs> really? Oh, well, you're going to enjoy this leek boil. <laughs> Jesus, help me out, Will you be so good a scoundrel as to eat it as a mark of respect? Base Trojan, I shall die before it, your stinky Oh, you speak leak. some truth at last. But I desire that you live in the meantime. I will make you eat on St. David's Day. If you can mock a leak, you can eat a leak, boy Uh, enough, Captain. You have paid him back. I say I will make him eat some part of my leek. Bite, I pray you, it is good for you to eat your greens. I will not eat my greens. Yes, you will. Certainly you will. Or never mock St. David's Day again. I will most horribly take revenge on you. I will not eat it. I eat, swear. I pray you. Will you have some sauce with your leek? There is not enough leek in the world to swear by. All right, stop your bastard. I'll eat it. Yes, you will. So much oh. good food for you now. Throw none of it away. The skin is good for you too. <laughs> and when you have occasion to see Leek again, I pray you will not mock them. No, sir. I'll be ah. good. Aye, Leek is good. And I'll bet you remember St. David's Day from now on. Ah. Yeah, all right, I will. I shall <laughs> never forget the Jesus, the taste of Leek. <laughs> yes, and you shall take the rest of it away too. Or I have another one in my pocket which you shall eat. <laughs> I'll take it. But I'll take it. I can't take it anymore. Oh, how shall stir for this? <laughs> go, go. You will not mock at an ancient tradition and show more honourable respect. You thought because he was not English, he could therefore not handle an Englishman. And now you find it otherwise. Let a Welshman teach you good English manners. Farewell, pistol, leek man. <laughs> leek a boy -o. <laughs> Never liked you, Gower. What do you want? What's this? Ugh. <laughs> Fortune plays havoc with me now, then. Bad news I have. My nail is dead. Come on now. And my friends are hung, hung for their crimes. Their bones left here in France. <laughs> Old I feel now, and from my weary limbs, service is gone. I may not be the most honourable soldier, but there is good in all men. Well, now I'll turn to England, and there are still some patches for my scars. And swear I got them all fighting in the Great War. Bollocks. General, sir, here comes the High Commander and his Fraulein. Finally. Now, may we have some peace between us? Or if you'd prefer terms for surrender, perhaps. For France, for Germany, for England and their peoples, I wish good health and fair treatment. Especially for Catherine of France, the woman you have held captive. I would like to see her and know how she lives. I thank you <coughs> for your kind treatment of the prisoners. General of England. You must know, my surrender will not be to you. I commend you for taking good care of our German prisoners. We hope by this meeting that we shall 
put an old Greece in quarrels. Oh, we agree to that, but uh, it appears here in the Eagle's Nest you have all become prisoners. My men surround the base of Mount Kelstein, after all. Yeah, we know, and I do wish that we could be allowed to return home to Berlin. My duty is to you both in equal respects. I have labored with all my wits to bring you both most honorable leaders to peace. I do agree with you, General, to be moderate towards the deal. If you wish for peace, you must buy that peace with full accord to our demands. You heard the terms, my Führer. I have not yet heard his answer. Well then, the peace we so urge lies in his very answer. I will, with a cursory eye, look at the articles for surrender. If we could appoint someone of your council to come with us and survey the wealth we have acquired, I think you will accept some form of surrender. Is that so difficult? Gower, go with them. I give you free power to ratify our demands. You, Ava, you'll stay here with us. How gracious of you, sir, but I must go with them. Happily, a woman's voice may do some good when talking for a piece. Oh, Kate, you're, you're alive. Um, <laughs> my orders since I left England have been to, to find you and to come here and to save you. We have not met, but uh, I personally feel as if I already know something of you. My apologies, Kate, I've, I've been at war so long. Quite forgotten how to properly speak to a lady. Will you teach a soldier how to speak his truth, perhaps? General, do you mock me? I cannot speak English as well as you. Well, um, Kate, if you can, if you can feel love in your heart, I will gladly hear you speak in your broken English tongue. For um, now, I see you for the first time. Uh, I will not waste my words. Um, do you like me? As, as a soldier, Kate. Pardonnez moi, I cannot tell what you mean by like me. Well, um, an, uh, an angel is, is like you, uh, too, Kate, and, and two are, are like an angel. What do you mean I am uh, like an angel? Oh, oui, yes, that is what the man says, yes. I think so, Kate, and and I believe it too. Oh, bon Dieu, les langues des hommes sont clairs de merde. What did she say? Uh, uh, that the uh, the tongues of the man's be full of deceit. That is what she says. <laughs> Spoken like a true English woman. <laughs> Kate, if my tongue is not fit for your understanding, then I'm glad that you can't speak English. I don't mince my words, but say directly to you. I love you, and so we shall shake on it and, and make a bargain. What do you say, my lady? With all due respect, I understand what you mean. <laughs> but I barely know you. My apologies, I... Uh... I speak as a plain soldier. But if you can love me for this, then if you can love a plain soldier, then take me. If not, I, I shall die. I know I have no gift in talking to a lady, but I do have a good heart. And if you can take a soldier, please take me. Please say something. Is it possible love at first sight? No, I, I, did, I did not think it possible, but uh, in loving me that you could love a friend who could keep you safe. I cannot tell what you are saying. <laughs> Kate, it is, it is easier for me to conquer nations than to speak to a beautiful woman. 
<laughs> but um, Kate, uh, Kate, do you believe in the stars or, or in fate? I believe in fate, but in love, I cannot tell what my fate is. <laughs> Can any of our neighbours tell, Kate? Please, just, just give me a chance. I don't know you. Then promise me, Kate, that you may have an answer for me soon. You are the most beautiful woman that I've ever seen. You are too much, but I like your words. By my honour, in, in truest English, I love you, Kate. Take my hand and say, Henry of England, I am yours, and then I will tell you aloud England is yours, Ireland is yours, France is yours, and Henry is definitely yours. Your answer now in broken music. Your voice is sweet music, and yes, your English is, is broken. Now please tell me, could you love me? Yes, if it will please you. <laughs> yes, it, it will please me, Kate, it shall please me. <laughs> then it shall please me. Well, upon that, I kiss your hand and I call you my queen. Stop! Stop! I don't know you so well. Well, if not your hand, I would rather kiss your lips, Kate. I will not be ça. Elle ne parle la comptume de France. Madame Alice, please be my interpreter again. What did she say? Uh, that it is not the fashion of the uh, ladies of France to, um, oh, I cannot tell you what it is, uh, they say, uh, um, um, mm, ah, ah, yes, uh, to kiss, to, to uh, kiss. Yes, uh, yes, you uh, understand better, c'est moi. <laughs> it is not a fashion for the women of France to kiss before they are married. Oh, oui, yes, that is what she says, yes. Okay. Nice customs curtsy to great people. Dear Catherine, you and I cannot be confined by our country's simple fashions. Do you have witchcraft in your lips, Kate? There is more of a sugar touch in them than in all of the tongues of France. Love is blind and I am blindly in love. <coughs> General, <coughs> sir. <coughs> Uh, the High Commander has granted every article of wealth stashed here. It was Eva that persuaded him. I forget how quietly you walk, Gower, but you may thank love for all our blindness. I will give you safe passage to cross the German border and retreat under a ceasefire. Let us not make more victims of this war, after all. They have consented to the terms, sir. Good. Gentlemen, I will make an oath. We shall have some peace from this exchange. And may this oath be well kept. May this act show that the kingdoms of Germany and England may be at peace. Let them have their freedom. I will give you all safe passage to retreat to Berlin. Thus are negotiations now complete and fair exchanges made. Only seen and heard by the eyes and ears in this room. Never to be repeated. I will return to Berlin to face the wrath of the Russian bear. God willing, I will bring him to his knees. I will make this oath. I shall take the prisoner Catherine with me, a prisoner no more. And our country shall no more be at war. For all tales must end and all rivers run into the sea. The deaths caused in this time shall never be forgotten by me. Thus far has our straining author pursued the story with his crude and inadequate writing keeping important people penned up in this little room, yelling while he mangled history's full glory with his uneven telling, uneven and strained. But seated thus, were you not entertained? 
The lifespan of our English hero was brief, yes, but in that brief time, he achieved greatness. He had good luck as a warrior. And with it, he created the world's greatest garden, a united Europe, shattered now asunder, why we all wait and watch in despair and wonder as to its fate. For once our allies, that mighty bear of Russia and the soaring eagle of the United States now peck and tear on the rotting corpse of Europe. <sighs> and would see its strength so hard and bitterly fought for, brought to bended knee to serve their will. Until, perhaps, another, braver than those who rule us now, <laughs> comes of position and restores our country's name to former glory. Will such a leader bring our kingdom all it needs? Will strip it of all and make it bleed? This tale, now in the making, this very day, yet to be told, will undoubtedly be performed on the stage of an unwritten future. Another play for you to kindly judge until the May.
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we would just like to thank the entire company uh, for this production, for everybody giving up their time uh, and um, pu putting in an incredible amount of dedication. Oh, there I am. Uh, to this production. Uh, everybody worked on it extremely hard. Uh, this is the third Outcast Creative production online, the fourth production since we set up the company in 2019. We have a simple goal, and that is to always pursue excellence and produce interesting and creative work. Uh, I'm going to turn over to Herr Hitler now uh, in case he... Uh, wishes to add anything. Um, uh, Dick and Tolson, who set up the Outcast Creative with me. Um, I will just want to give a big uh, congratulations to Toby Cockrell. It's the first time that the um, Outcasts have uh, uh, relinquished the reins um, and he steered the ship or the horse um, with that analogy very well. Um, so I, I really want to give it up for the adaptation and the um, directorial debut under the Outcast banner of Toby Cockrell. Well played, sire. Fantastic job, sir. And uh, we know that he's already working on his um, 22 adaptation uh, of Ham Hamlet. Uh, comes in Coming in 20 parts. Um, we are going to do more Shakespeare. We have at least two more productions uh, coming to you, always performed live. Uh, if you want to get involved as an actor or help out in any other way, if you have another skill set you'd like to get involved, um, the idea is that we all get something out of it. Contact us via the Outcast Creative Facebook page. Uh, we have another show coming up in July called The Warm Up, which is going to be a lot of fun. It's about a group of actors getting together online to do a show. Which is hilarious, darling. Uh, and warming up uh, before the show. Uh, so that's, uh, that's going to be a good one. Uh, Dickon is directing one cast in that, and I will be directing another cast. And we'll be streaming that both live on Facebook for the first time and also separately on YouTube. So you'll be able to catch uh, both of those. Then we have a Christmas show coming up, which may or may not be online. Uh, what's that going to be about, Dickon? Um, I think it's going to be about somebody who wakes up and has a revelation and realises that they're actually going to be a good person for the rest of their life. It's going to be a Christmas theme play, i.e. The Christmas Carol. Uh, adaptation of. Um, we'll save the main character for um, Another time. a reveal closer to the time. Yeah, yeah it's not going to be Boris Johnson. So um, uh, we'd just like the outcast to come on camera now and take a bow, please, uh, for the fantastic job, four performances, not a lot of rehearsal. Uh, without any further ado, we have Callum Schooler. Uh, we have Rez Kempton all the way from Los Angeles. We have Melissa Stanton. We have Paul Brennan representing the Al Capone family from Chicago. <laughs> Scott Barrington. We have Chris, who can never get his camera to work as Corporal Nim. He's on the bus. Corporal Lim is on the bus. Chris can't wait. He's already on his way to a nightclub. We have Sebastian <laughs> Story, Penny Merlin Woods, uh, Maggie Reed, and uh, last but by no means least, Edward Glennie as the young bearded prince and uh, our director, uh, Toby. Uh, coming now from his Nazi mountaintop uh, hideout, as you can see. Uh, cast, take a big bow. You have certainly deserved it. And uh, final word to Toby quickly, and then we are going to head off, everyone. Uh, I just really wanted to thank everyone involved. This is a Shakespearean dream I've always had to to put the plays out there for anyone who, uh, who wants to hear them in a different setting, a different texture, a different way. And I think we achieved it. Uh, well done, everyone. Thank you for your dedication. And uh, yeah, the outcast is amazing. Thank you, Lance. Thank you, Dickon. Okay, thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Do subscribe to the channel. Uh, like our Facebook page. 
share our stuff. It's always free to watch. Uh, you know, we're going to keep it as uh, free as we can um, because uh, our actors need to be seen. Uh, they're an incredibly talented bunch and uh, we're always interested and available for paid work. So <laughs> things, uh, get in touch with them or their agents uh, and they will be very grateful to hear from you. Uh, with that said, it's good night from me and Dickens. Good night from him. And it's good night from him. <laughs>